Hi, I'm Sarah from The Upcoming, and it's an absolute pleasure to be able to speak to you today. Um, maybe you could just kick off with a brief introduction to this incredible documentary, Fadia's Tree. Um, what can people expect if they watch it? Uh, I think they can expect a moving film about an unexpected friendship and an unlikely friendship that crosses borders, political lines, maps. Um, and it's a film that's about a quest, if you like. It's a, it's a kind of modern day quest that, um, that this woman who, I, who lives in a refugee camp in Lebanon, a Palestinian woman who I met completely by chance um, and who has developed into a very close friend, um, she sends me on a quest to find an ancient mulberry tree that once grew next to her grandfather's house in what is now northern Israel, where she is not permitted to go. And so for her, if that tree is still there, that symbolizes both home, family, and um, having, having a member of the family in, in what she considers to be home. Mm. So, but it's also a film that uses birds and bird migration as a way of thinking beyond politics and 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 the, as I said the lines on the map it's a way of um, the birds kind of reconnect people in place that have been scattered and fragmented through conflict and um, all the troubles in the Middle East over the 20th century. And of course it's your um, debut feature um, and that the, the friendship and, and the process of making it here was a real sort of long, slow burn over 15 years. So at what point um, after you'd met Fadia, did you decide, right, this is going to be um, the perfect subject for my, my first uh, feature documentary? And did you have any idea at that point that it would be over this length of time? Um, no, I definitely didn't. I mean, I trained as a visual artist at Central St. Martins in London. That was... And that's what I was being when I met her in a cafe in Beirut, where I'd gone for a, a conference, an art conference, and I was spending the last day on my own. And I, um, I, I, I met with Fadia, and then when we stayed in touch, and when she um, invited me to come and stay, meet her family in the camp, and I said, well, what could I do that's useful? And she said, come and make a film. And I said, well, I don't really make documentary films. I make short artist films that get shown in museums and art galleries and, you know, out of the way places. But I don't I don't do that kind of film. But anyway, I went out with a camera and I started shooting as soon as I got there. And I had no idea what this film was going to be about in the beginning. But I had incredible access um, to the community and the camp. And I felt very privileged to have that insider's view of what is a deeply painful situation there that's been there now for 74 years, this camp on one square kilometre of ground. It's never been expanded since 1948 when it was set up. And the original 3,000 people now number 50,000 people on this one square kilometre. So, mm -hmm. and there's still no fresh water, um, so it's there's no drinking water and they have to buy water for cooking and and drinking mm. um so it's yeah it's a deeply depressing place but against that there are these moments of incredible humanity and incredible uh resistance to the situation and um, fadia who set up a, a children's kindergarten um 30 years ago is is just such an incredible symbol of the human, the, the human spirit's um, ability to, to conquer the, the situations that are, are placed upon it. Mm. And I could, could uh, be my own ignorance, but of course I read so much, you know, over the years about um, Palestine and, and the situation there, but I actually wasn't fully aware of, you know, this displacement of people, the fact that it had been put into law into uh, that, that they should be have the right of return and that they haven't been allowed to do so so how much were you aware of that situation or did you have to were you yourself like having to educate yourself in the process of making this documentary about the specifics of this situation um yes it's been a huge educational journey for me this i was aware that the british had been involved in um the uh 
the transition of, of Palestine and the them, you know, they, they walked out um, before 1948 and kind of left the situation having at the, during the First World War, they, they took control of, of Palestine and other um, areas of land and um, in, in that region. And they, um, they had a mandate in Palestine up until 1948. But then they could see that the, the situation was becoming difficult and they walked away and um, almost a million Palestinians were forced out of their villages and their homes, but they always felt they were just going to be uh, away for a short time. They fled across the borders to uh, Jordan, Syria and Lebanon, but they always thought they were coming back. These refugee camps that were set up then were only ever temporary. So, um, so the number of Palestinians, displaced Palestinians in the world now numbers over 7 million and those who are eligible to seek UN humanitarian assistance is over 5 million. So, uh, and this, uh, the right of return, which is sort of what the film is about, is about following your instinct to, for home, which the migrating birds follow their homing instinct, but the people on the ground cannot. Um, the United Nations drew up a resolution, resolution 194, just after um, the State of Israel was formed, which basically states that after the situation of war or whatever has displaced a people, it should be their right to return to their home or to be compensated for that which they have lost. Um, this uh, document uh, refers to all refugees. While it was initially set up for Palestinian refugees, it actually is applicable to all bodies of refugees. And it's been passed through the United Nations 135 times since its initial um, creation. So, you know, it just is very sad to see what is now five generations of people living in this refugee camp, just waiting for something to happen. And, and in Lebanon, they are not granted citizenship, so they have their refugee status, they cannot do certain many um, jobs they're not allowed to apply for, they're really only supposed to do uh, manual labour jobs, and they don't have the same health care or benefits, um, pensions or anything that, that the Lebanese citizens have access to. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just a very sad story, and I think... Um, I did not think of myself as a political person when I set out to make this film, but it's it's something, it was just being in that situation and seeing the conditions of people and being so moved by how they've endured for so long that I felt I really wanted to tell a story in a different way that might re-engage people to think about this and to try and, you know, I mean, obviously I can't single-handedly change the situation in the, in the Middle East, but it just seems a huge injustice that needs to be put right mm. sooner than later. So, and, um, and tell us about the kind of logistics of putting it together, because like we mentioned at the beginning, there's 50 years is a long time. And um, what seems to emerge from watching it is that perhaps there was a kind of slight blurred line between kind of um, you know, filmmaker and subject, and, and you know, there's an amazing, amazing. friendship that, that that kind of emerged between the two of you. So, um, what was that process like, both as a filmmaker, but also for you as an individual? And how on earth did you go about kind of collecting? I don't know how many hours of footage you had, um, and and to make that into a, a narrative feature. Uh, well, I had over 400 hours of footage. Um, and uh, I'd spent a lot of time in the West Bank of Palestine trying to understand the context for the situation of the refugees. So while I was working on other art, art projects, uh, I was continually working on this. So I would go to the refugee camp maybe once a year. Um, I managed to get some teaching at an art school in Ramallah in the West Bank, and I was invited there. I spent most of a year living in Jerusalem in 2009 where I discovered the importance of the region to bird migration and that's when I thought maybe I could make a film that would zoom out from the claustrophobia on the ground but it was how to bring the birds and Fadia in the camp together 
which beyond just the fact that their journeys geographically seem to connect, um, that took me meeting my amazing producer, Susan Simnett of Over the Fence Films, who um, was not working with documentary at the time, and but she we met through a program called Filmonomics that was run by the now director of the BFI Film Fund, Mia Bayes at the time. And um, it was this fantastic workshop where we met and Susan could see there was something in this film. And she was determined to help me get it out into the world. And um, without her, I don't think this would have happened. Mm. And we engaged a, a wonderful um, editor, female editor, Ariadna Fatio Vilas, who very patiently with me waded through the 400 hours and we had hundreds and hundreds of post-it notes and we were trying to create a narrative with our post-it notes. There were multiple different avenues that we went up, but in the end it was this, yeah, this, this journey to find a tree that, that I sort of become the avatar for my friend. I become, I sort of go by proxy to her homeland and her, the, the village that she feels is her, her village where she's never, been allowed to go and she was born in the refugee camp in Lebanon so it's uh it's a story that yeah I travel many times looking and it's um it's uh, I many times I wanted to give up the project but I promised Fadia I would make this film and I felt for her and her community I could not let them down yeah. but there were many times I felt I wanted to walk away because the uh it's a it's a heavy subject and it's just how to find a way that injects some air into that mm. um which for me the birds perhaps offered that possibility mm. was there a particular moment that you felt that most acutely that that was particularly challenging and then on the other side a moment that kind of made it all feel worth it and and you had that kind of moment of release or joy um that you were going to kind of complete this and complete your mission well, I think really meeting um, the producer, Susan, was that moment of recognition that really I'd been working entirely on my own. I'd been my own producer. I was self-shooting director, doing picture and sound. Um, and I taught myself all of that as well, really, because all the films I'd made before had been, I mean, they still are. I still work with a fixed camera and, um, but I'd never, yeah, I'd never used a, a radio mic before or, you know, all, all these things I, I learned along the way. So in a way it was like going to film school this uh, on my own, but it was a lonely journey at times. And um, so to have that support in these last four years, four or five years, to, to bring the film to this place has been um, extraordinary. Yeah, I, I feel so blessed for that really. Mm. Um, and, and Fadi is happy that I showed her the film before, before I sh showed it anywhere publicly. Mm. And uh, she just cried and she just got up and gave me a silent hug. Which was, yeah, it's very, very moving. <laughs> and, you know, what do you hope people take away from watching it? Because as you mentioned there, I guess one of the challenges is this is a heavy subject matter. But there is the, the film is infused with the sense of hope and, and the kind of juxtaposition, the parallels made with the, with the bird migration and the idea of like, you know, that homey instinct. Um, it, yeah, it gives you a, a sense of hope for the future. Um, so, so what do you hope that people take away from watching it? And what do you think some of the themes that emerge? Because of course it's Fadia's story, Fadia's tree, but, but it's not just Fadia's story because it's a, a way in for people to understand the human story behind the headlines, behind some of the sort of technical challenges of some of these issues? Well, I think that I hope that people will engage and that they um, will understand that, you know, every, I mean, they, they know, people know that everyone has the right to have a home. Um, this body of people have been dealt a very severe blow by history. They have no home. So it's, you know, if people would like to lobby their MPs to re redress this, because really the, the British has uh, a lot of complicity in, in the refugees being in this situation. Um, 
then I, yeah, I would feel that the, that the film could be uh, a useful tool to open up debate about this injustice and about human, the human right to have a home and the right to return to that home. And do you also see that um, a film like this is a great example of kind of the power of film and of cinema and of documentary film to kind of talk about these sort of like tricky issues. Maybe people don't fully understand it, you know, from reading news articles, but the, the, the sort of emotional side, the human story side, um, you know, allows people to empathize in a way that, you know, reading a news story maybe doesn't allow you to. So do you see the power of cinema in that sense in these particular issues? Um, hugely, yes. I mean, I consider this a film, not necessarily a documentary film, that it has a narrative. Um, it wants to engage with the public. Um, and I've really worked to make it a poetic story. It's not, I'm not a, a news journalist. I'm not a, uh, I'm someone who used to make paintings and um, been very specific about composition. So I kind of make moving paintings in a cinematic way now, I think through film. And I think, yeah, I think film offers these possible ways of intercutting different narratives to build an unexpected third narrative. I mean, you know, we managed to find a way to bring the birds and Fadia and the tree together um, in, a, in a way that is, is hard, I think, in, in other media. But film offers you that way of looking at the past, the present and the future simultaneously which is, I think it's, it's wonder. And the other thing I wanted to mention was, um, you know, it's a very female story, both in, in your subject, but also the fact that it was you making the film and your producer. Um, so what do you think that brings to it in terms of its kind of tone and feeling? And did you at any point um, feel that you were presented with challenges? Because I know certainly, you know, in, in, in film in general, but in particularly documentary film, it's, often felt very male dominated. So was that something that, that was an extra challenge or, or you didn't encounter anything like that? Well, I think I was working entirely on my own um, and I was self-funding where I could or I was invited by cultural institutions through my work as an artist. So I wasn't feeling it in the film world then. And then I had the good fortune to be um, invited to be part of the Filmonomics course, which is part of Bird's Eye View and Reclaim the Frame, which is really about redressing the balance of uh, women and people of, of color um, in film. And that, that was a huge support to be surrounded by mostly women and, um, and to feel we'd, yeah, we, 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 we have this, uh, we don't have to, we don't feel um, put down in any way. No, we have this incredible strength and we must use it. So, and in terms of the film, um, uh, this female friendship, I mean, I think, I think that was very important that it is a woman to woman um, story of trust, I think, between two women, me and Fadia, but it's also a story of trust from the, the producer Susan to take on this film and and believe in it and 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 our editor Ariadna. Um, so I, it has been yeah in these last stages it has been a very female driven endeavour to get it out into the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm out of time, but just very finally, you know, how does it feel to have the recognition that you've already had so far? And of course, it's still getting its release, you know, um, from Amnesty International, for example. And maybe you can quickly tell us what you might be working on next, even though you weren't set, setting out originally to become um, a documentary filmmaker or a filmmaker in general. You know, what, what do you, will you continue down this path or you kind of veer back into your, your art world? Oops. Um... Yes, uh, I can't remember what the beginning. Oh yes, it, um, yes, it's it's been quite extraordinary the response to the film. I feel I feel very humbled, but very moved that these people and their situation and they tell me frequently we feel invisible, we feel overlooked. They they are feeling there's some of the repercussions of the film coming out is trickling back to the camp, and I think that um, that has been. Uh, the biggest thing for me, the, the, 
how Fadia and, and her community are really um, happy with it. And, mm. and so that's, that's one factor. Um, and yeah, I didn't expect it to, to be in cinemas nationwide. I mean, I, yes, I, that was in my dreams, but the fact that I'll be sitting in the ICA next week and the Curse in Bloomsbury, um, and then it's going all around the country and I'm doing a lot of Q and A's, so that was, yeah. That was in my wildest dreams, but they seemed a little um, unrealistic at the time. <laughs> so huge, yeah, it's been a huge, huge journey in which I've learned an enormous amount. And then strangely, Fadia came over here for a couple of screens. We had a screening at BFI South Bank and one at the Whitechapel Art Gallery. And she came over for a month and we I showed her some of England and we traveled to the Lake District. And we stayed on a farm there, a sheep farm. And I heard that the farmer was going to be leaving at the end of the summer. And I've always been fascinated by sheep and hefted sheep, sheep that generation after generation know their patch of landscape. They know their common land on top of the fell. And so I've started making film in that farm about um, sheep in the Lake District. <laughs> so that's, yeah. Having said, I will never make another documentary film after this one. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Um, well, can't wait to see the product of that as well. But of course, for everyone else to be able to see Fadia's Treat, which is coming out in cinemas um, very soon. So thank you so much for sharing all that with us. I can't wait for everyone else to see the film. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely to chat to you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>